Good evening. My name is Brian Grubbs. I'm the manager of local history and genealogy at the Springfield Green County Library District. Tonight's program is part of a series brought to you in partnership with the Missouri Museum, or the History Museum on the Square, Wilson's Creek National Battlefield, Missouri State University, and the Missouri Humanities Council. This program series centers on the struggle for statehood, a traveling exhibit commemorating the bicentennial of Missouri statehood. This exhibit was created by the Missouri Humanities Council in partnership with the Kinder Institute on Constitutional Democracy at the University of Missouri. Support for the program series is provided by the National Endowment for the Humanities. I hope you will visit the Struggle for Statehood uh, exhibit, which is currently at the History Museum on the Square. The exhibit will also be at the Library Center between August, or excuse me, July 6th and August 6th. Before we get started with tonight's program, I wanna go over a few housekeeping details. Tonight, we'll hear from Dr. William Belko, who I will introduce shortly. We will watch his pre-recorded presentation, which will be followed by a live Q&A session. Your, microfo your microphones are muted and your camera is turned off. You can type your questions into the chat window, which I will monitor throughout the program. You can also notify me and I will unmute your microphone and you can ask your questions directly to Dr. Belko. Dr. William S. Belko, is the executive director of the Missouri Humanities Council. He has published several monographs and award-winning articles on various subjects in early 19th century American history. From 2005 to January of 2015, Belko was an associate professor of history, director of the graduate program in early American studies, and director of the graduate certificate program in history preservation at the University of West Florida. He taught courses on Jacksonian America, the early Republic, the Southern Frontier, U.S. Constitutional History, and Historic and Pre uh, Heritage Preservation. He received his PhD in history from Mississippi State University, his Master's of Art degree in history from Southwest Missouri State University, and a Bachelor of Arts degree with a double major in history and political science from Drury. So now without further ado, we will watch Dr. Belko's presentation. When most people hear about uh, the Missouri Compromise, or rather Missouri compromises to be more accurate. They most certainly conjure in their minds the great national struggle over slavery, which will set into motion an inevitable course towards disunion and civil war. But there is so much more to the story of the Missouri admission crisis that will not come to their mind. Yet a powerful play indeed occurred simultaneously the Missouri admission crisis, one that cannot be separated from Missouri's struggle to enter the Union. Throughout February and March of 1818, Missourians continued to send memorials to Congress requesting state pressing for our immediate admission into the Union. One of those dates was March 16th, 1818 less than a week after the U.S. invasion of Spanish Florida, better known today as the First Seminole. Again, much of our state's formative years are very struggle to enter the Union from 1818 to 1821 is shaped by Andrew Jackson. And this arises from his role in the Creek War from 1813 to 1814, and his subsequent invasion and consequent seizure of Florida in 1818. Florida's story evolves with that of Missouri's in the years after Jackson's thumping of the British forces outside of New Orleans. In the wake of Jackson's acquisition of Florida, as controversial as it was, uh, the Spanish question, as US leaders dubbed it from this point on, arising from Jackson's invasion and occupation, Spanish Florida in 1818, went hand in hand with the Missouri question, as again, US leaders labeled the issue. And both were very controversial to say the least. Both questions at their heart were about the expansion of the United States in the wake of the War of 1812, an expansion that included slavery. Indeed, the volatile, intense, vitriolic debates consuming the House and Senate over whether to admit Missouri with or without slavery coincided with equally passionate debates over Jackson's actions regarding Florida. In fact, Missouri's territorial delegate to Congress, John Scott, 
feared that the brouhaha over the invasion of Florida the previous year could derail Missouri's pursuit of admission. When Congress adjourned in early March of 1819 without admitting Missouri, there was an eruption of newspaper editorials nationwide. During these early editorial debates, Missourians recognized a connection with the Florida issue. That is that the Missouri admission crisis could undermine U.S. negotiations with Spain and the consequent addition of Florida to the United States, something which Missourians favored ardently. It was common at that time for Missouri newspapers to run articles reporting on the admission struggle and immediately turning attention to discussions on the Spanish question. The St. Louis Inquirer, uh, as an example, started uh, the editorial section of one of its editions with an article raising concerns over Congress's recent failure to pass a bill admitting Missouri, and then immediately delved into the Florida crisis, praising news of uh, Adams' negotiations with Spain and our consequent acquisition of Florida on the very same day, March 24, 1819, the Missouri Gazette likewise gave attention to the Missouri crisis but only after lauding the transcontinental treaty. The paper declared that, quote, this highly important treaty, so long wished, so long expected, if ratified, will impose on Congress the necessity of organizing a government for that territory before adjournment, and will add thus much to the mass of important business already before them. When Congress returned in December of 1819, Missouri and Florida once again assumed center stage. It all started on December 7th, 1819, when President Monroe delivered his annual message to Congress, whereby he asked Congress for discretionary authority to reoccupy Florida, essentially putting the treaty into effect unilaterally. On that very day, the territorial delegate from Missouri, John Scott, presented to the House of Representatives a host of memorials from Missourians, again demanding admission into the Union. The following day, December 8th, the Maine District of Massachusetts also requested state. The concurrent admission of both Missouri and Maine will alter dramatically the course of the Missouri admission crisis. The very next day, December 15th, New Hampshire Congressman Arthur Livermore asked to postpone consideration of the Missouri Admission Bill into January of 1820. Mr. Livermore of New Hampshire observed that the Missouri question was of great moment and deserving of full consideration, and one that was unfortunately calculated to excite irritation. He therefore hoped that it would be postponed to a later day in the session, that other business of a pressing nature might be first disposed of. It could not be material whether Missouri be made a state this day or at the end of the present session. Well, the House agreed, but the Florida question now came to the attention of Congress. On December 21st, the House took up debate on a bill for covering American losses during the Florida invasion without any decision. The next day, December 22nd, the House revisited the issue in lengthy debate again, coming to no resolution of the issue. Throughout the second session of the 16th Congress from January through early March of 1820, uh, the debates over Missouri coincided with debates arising from the First Seminole War and the unratified treaty with Spain to acquire it. When the U.S. House of Representatives adjourned on Saturday, February 26th, after a lengthy debate over the admission of Missouri, that body then took up debate on the First Seminole War when it reconvened the following Monday, February 28th. In fact, on Friday, March 3rd, 1820, the U.S. Senate debated the admission of Maine, which had been an integral feature of the Missouri admission crisis, and then immediately debated General Andrew Jackson's memorial to Congress, whereby General Jackson defended his actions in Florida in 1818. And then the Senate returned immediately to the Maine Bill, admitting Maine as a state 
and accepting Missouri's admission as well. But while the Missouri issue appeared to end finally, the divisive debate still threatened the acquisition of Florida. In late March and early April of 1820, just a few weeks after the Missouri admission crisis appeared to have come to a very timely end, Congress returned to the question of the treaty with Spain. In the meantime, President Monroe threatened to invade Florida and take possession of it by force. So understanding the writing on the wall, if you will, Spain finally approved the 1819 Transcontinental Treaty on October 24, 1820. On July 10, 1821, in an official ceremony with Spain, General Jackson raised the stars and stripes over the territory of Florida. Exactly a month later, on August 10, 1821, President Monroe finally and officially proclaimed the territory of Missouri as the 24th state in the Union. U.S. acquisition of Spanish Texas, as much as that of Spanish Florida, likewise consumed many Americans during the Missouri admission crisis. And again, as with the Florida crisis, served as an integral component U.S. territorial expansion and diplomatic nationalism immediately following the War of 1812. However, the allure of Texas as that of Florida began during the war with Great Britain. During the Missouri admission debacle, Missourians also demanded U.S. acquisition of Texas. And many believed, as other Jacksonian Democrats, that there was ample evidence of our undoubted right to the Spanish territory. During the summer of 1819, for example, the St. Louis Enquirer ran a short piece on the appeal of Texas and recognized that it will quickly become a destination for adventurers. Quote, the people of the Western country are exceedingly interested in the fate of this province, proclaimed the paper, because upon its fate, depends in a great degree the fate of Mexico. And unless Mexico becomes free, we cannot expect to come in for any share of the rich products of her gold and silver mines. Every friend to the Western country, every man who wishes to see gold and silver abundant in this country, and all who wish to see liberty continue her march to the Pacific Ocean must wish success to the adventurers in Texas, unquote. Not surprisingly, this opinion piece, common to the Missouri perspective, was followed by grand jury presentments, one from Washington County, Missouri, and the other from Jefferson County, Missouri, both demanding admission into the Union without any restriction regarding slavery. One of the largest American colonies in Texas was that uh, spearheaded by Moses Austin and his son, Stephen F. Austin, founders of Herculaneum, Missouri. The Austins uh, operated extensive mining operations in eastern Missouri, south of St. Louis. Although Moses Austin will die back at his plantation in Missouri, Durham Hall, his son will see his goals in Texas come to fruition, the Austin Company composed of about 300 families immigrating from Missouri. So the recognized father of Texas came from Missouri and settled in Texas in 1821, the year of our state. We have to keep in mind that the direct link between U.S. claims and eventual access to the extensive Oregon Territory commenced in Missouri. The embarkation point for the Oregon Trail started in what will become Kansas City, Missouri, arguably the real gateway to the West. Either way, Missouri uh, is the point of origin for what Americans would so proudly dub manifest destiny. During the contentious Missouri admission debates and following on the heels of Congress's first failure to admit Missouri in March of 1819, 
Missourians remained attentive to American movements in the Pacific Northwest, as much so as they did with U.S. negotiations with Spain to acquire Florida. For example, the St. Louis Inquirer, in a single edition, in March of 1819, focused first on Congress's refusal to admit Missouri as a state with slavery, followed by an article praising the news of the adams onus Treaty and the consequent acquisition of Florida, followed then by reports of the establishment of an American settlement along the Columbia River in the Oregon Territory and the consequent riches our country would reap from international trade in the Pacific Ocean along the Pacific Rim. To accomplish this end, the Monroe administration arranged what would become known as the Yellowstone Expedition. In March of 1818, Brigadier General Thomas A. Smith, stationed at Bellefontaine, Missouri, received instructions from President Monroe to commence operations up the Missouri River. After examining the maps made by Lewis and Clark, Smith was, in his words to Monroe, strongly impressed. And so he commenced operations ascending the Missouri River in May of 1818, just a few months after Missouri petitioned Congress for statehood. Missourians closely monitored the progress of the expedition, giving it uh, considerable attention in the months following the failure of Congress to admit Missouri in the spring of 1819. In fact, newspaper updates informing the public of the details of the expedition ran right alongside editorials chastising Congress and demanding immediate admission with slavery untouched. During the summer of 1890, for example, the Missouri Gazette deemed the expedition to be a great national objective, and it would be one of the greatest usefulness to the country, as we hope it will succeed. Other Missouri newspapers as often exhibited the same attention and excitement about the expedition. That same summer, uh, is just another example, the St. Louis Inquirer reported on the arrival of the Western engineer under the command of Stephen Long. The paper then noted the arrival of U.S. troops that would accompany the expedition northward, followed by a report of the quote unquote elegant entertainment that the citizens of St. Louis hosted for the contingent. The very next article, titled The Missouri Slave Question, which provided a lengthy discussion into Missouri's ongoing failure to become a state. Throughout the summer and early fall of 1819 and into early 1820, when Congress resumed debate on Missouri's admission, this was the pattern of Missouri newspapers, reporting on the status of the Yellowstone expedition and then fuming over the admission crisis and vice versa. As a result, Long will leave the expedition there, Council Bluffs, he will return east for the winter. In the meantime, he ordered a Western exploration by land to search for the source of the Platte River. Long returned in May of 1820, less than two months after President Monroe signed the Missouri Bill into law, authorizing the people of Missouri to create a constitution and state government. He ascended the Platte River to its source climbed Pikes Peak to its summit, descended the Arkansas River, headed to Fort Smith, which is in the Arkansas Territory, and finally dispersed to Cape Girardeau, Missouri in October of 1820, just days after Missouri's first General Assembly elected our state's first two U.S. Senators, Thomas Hart Benton and David Barton. But this rapid and rampant westward migration came at an equally and less recognized, more ruthless cost. For Missouri also witnessed the largest westward migration of another of the continent's inhabitants, the American Indian. Tens of thousands of Native Americans migrated into and out of the territory, directly and indirectly, a result of the simultaneous westward migration 
of European settlers, commencing from the first days of contact. While uh, we Americans of European descent celebrate our westward advance, we fail to remember the other westward retreat, one that came directly at the expense of our progress. It is incumbent on Missouri and the nation as a whole, therefore, to memorialize this migration as well. And again, Missouri manifests this somber story of our national history more than any other state. The notorious Trail of Tears, for example, passes through Missouri along three routes and extends over 600 miles throughout the state, the most mileage of any state. But thousands of other Native peoples traverse these trails and numerous other traces and pathways in our state. Many of the original inhabitants of the Missouri Territory encountered the migration of other Native peoples as a result of European expansion as early as the period of the Revolutionary War, causing substantial changes in their ways of life, and in most cases, forcing them westward as a consequence. The ancestral inhabitants of Missouri the Osage primarily relinquished in 1808 title to an enormous swath of their ancestral lands, encompassing nearly the entirety of the modern state of Missouri. Other Indian tribes, moreover, such as the once powerful and populous Delaware and Shawnee, pushed themselves by the relentless white expansion across the Appalachian Divide, had already crossed the Mississippi into the Louisiana Territory prior to American purchase. Well before the Indian Removal Act of 1830, thousands of native peoples from north and south and east pressed into Missouri, as nearly every presidential administration prior to that of Andrew Jackson actively and aggressively sought acquisition of native lands for American settlement, accomplishing their objectives basically by any means necessary, resorting to armed conflict when negotiation failed. Following the 1830 Indian Removal Act, the Trail of Tears, the most familiar consequence of the tragic Indian Removal Act, merely continued the westward migration, more accurately, the retreat of the American Indian. Although recognized as the route taken by the Cherokee, thousands of the other historic tribes of the American Southeast, the Chickasaw, Choctaw, Creek, and Seminole, likewise took these very same trails to their new homes out West. But here again, Missouri also played a central role in the origins of Indian Group throughout its rocky quest for statehood arguably becoming the first territory to implement such a policy. And again, our struggle for statehood cannot be dissected from the desire of Missourians to rid the territory of the original inhabitants. Just five years after the United States acquired the Louisiana Territory, U.S. officials commenced the policy of extinguishing Indian title to the territory west of the Mississippi River, Missouri especially. On a crisp autumn day in 1808, elders of the Osage people gathered at Fort Clark, a new U.S. outpost overlooking the Missouri River near what is today Sibley, Missouri, about 25 miles east of Kansas City. The council assembled to consider a treaty with the young United States and its newly acquired Louisiana territory a treaty demanding that they relinquish claim to over 52 million acres of their homeland. The treaty came with a threat, sign, or become enemies of the United States. Earlier that year, confrontations between the Osage and encroaching American settlers prompted Louisiana Territorial Governor Meriwether Lewis to encourage neighboring Indian nations to, quote, wage war against the Osage, to cut them off completely, or drive them from their country, unquote. So the uh, prospect of unending war most certainly colored the consideration of the Osage elders as they considered the treaty proposal. 
Over 100 elders indeed signed the treaty, ceding nearly the entirety of the current state of Missouri. In exchange, the Osage received the promise of U.S. protection, $1,200 in cash, and merchandise of about a similar value. This compensation to the Osage amounted to 0 0.005 cents an acre. With the resumption of massive American migration into Missouri after the conclusion of the War of 1812, Indian affairs once again assumed a primary place in U.S. policy making. Just two months after the drubbing British forces below New Orleans, uh, President Madison on March 11, 1815, commissioned the Missouri territorial governor, William Clark, along with several prominent figures from the new Midwest, uh, Missouri fur trader, August Shoto, and the uh, Illinois territorial governor, Ninian Edwards, to negotiate treaties with all of the Indian tribes that laid some claim or another to what is Missouri, whereby they would recognize U.S. dominion over the region. These treaties, known as the Portage de Sioux Treaties, uh, because they were signed at Portage de Sioux, Missouri, along the banks of the Mississippi River in St. Charles County, Missouri, involved numerous tribes, the Potawatomi, Pankasho, Lakota, Dakota, Sioux, Omaha, Kickapoo, Sac and Fox, Iowa, and the Osage. Removal treaties involving Missouri will follow in short time as part of the Monroe administration's concerted effort to exchange Indian lands in the east for lands in the west, just beyond Missouri's western border. Fortunately for the cause of the American Indian, aggressive and rampant American expansion into recognized Indian territory continued unabated during Missouri's struggle for statehood. Just five days before the Missouri State Legislature passed the Solemn Public Act, that is, it's part of the bargain for final acceptance into the Union, promising never to enforce the controversial section of its Constitution. Secretary of War Calhoun wrote to General Henry Atkinson about Indian anxieties over continued white expansion into their treaty lands. It would do no good. With Missouri statehood officially recognized in August of 1821, the floodgates of American expansion westward had been fully opened. We will be known thenceforward as the gateway to the West, the embarkation point of the great Western trails from the Santa Fe Trail to the Oregon Trail. Thank you, Steve, so much for sharing that with us. Well, as uh, I think I mentioned to you, this is actually kind of a, a long trailer, if you will, uh, that we have a four-part series that goes into this far more uh, with detail, uh, some of them about 45 minutes long, and they will be on our video archives on our website, hopefully sometime, um, hopefully this month for sure. So um, yeah, so stay tuned. Like I said, there's, there's so much more to it. I always hate these kind of trailers because you're not really getting into it, but the, the hunt, the I, I guess the main part of it is, is how intertwined uh, westward expansion, diplomatic nationalism uh, came along with the Missouri crisis, um, especially for Missourians. That's all they talked about. If it wasn't us getting into the Union, it was removing Indians. It was trails westward uh, up the Missouri Valley, um, acquiring Texas, making sure we had Florida. And there's a lot of views, for example, of uh, a lot of letters in Missouri newspapers and they're mentioning in the same sentences almost that one has to go with the other. If we lose Florida, we lose Missouri and vice versa. Um, so really there's an anti-Eastern perspective for most of the West, but definitely for Missourians who were so much more westward looking. Um, so I, I think that's uh, something important to, to keep in mind. And it's kind of why we did this video um, and this series of videos to, to show that there's other issues involved with Missouri coming into the union. Yeah, I think it's interesting uh, when you when you look at Missouri entering the Union um, and what we're taught in school, right, is you have the Missouri Compromise. You have Missouri and Maine coming in and there was a struggle um, and this was the solution. And after that, it was 
easy peasy, but you don't realize how difficult the struggle was for Missouri to become a state starting in 1818, 1819, 1820, and finally in 1821, and how this issue of Missouri statehood was tied into all these larger events that were taking place. And so I thought that was particularly interesting. Right. There's a lot of letters from, you know, John Scott to Thomas Hart Benton and David Barton, our, our, you know, our first two senators and our congressmen about this, how they just monitored what was going on with the first civil war and the treaty with Spain uh, and following it right in tandem with, with, you know, their own admission problems of getting into the union. So um it's interesting. No, I'll just th throw this one out here. Um, I, it's not in any of the videos, and it's something I did a presentation on before. And I'll just kind of touch it lightly. I don't know if anybody out there has ever heard of circular letters of congressmen. And back in uh, the early period that, that I study, these are letters to their constituents. They're extremely long. and They're actually pretty rare. Um, in fact, Noble Cunningham, who's a, a former professor um, at the University of Missouri, uh, published these in three volumes. Um, from 1790s up to about 1829 or so. And they're fascinating to study because there's only so many of them left, uh, but they are powerful uh, you know, statements from a, from a congressman in the U.S. House of Representatives to their constituents. And so I decided I want to go look at these and do a test case. And it just shows you um, sometimes that we, we got to be careful when we concentrate on that issue of slavery driving the whole issue. That tends to be more of an Eastern looking westward, whether in the westward looking eastward, but uh, of the eight letters that are extant from 1818, uh, the issue of Florida and Spain are, are mentioned uh, in over 122 lines, wow. uh, almost 1,600 words. Missouri, nada. So if you turn to 1819, there's eight letters left, and it's powerful. This is the first great debate on, on Missouri entering the Union. And on February 15th of 1819, one of the congressmen started off his letter, no question of great national importance presented itself for discussion until the Committee on Military Affairs on the subject of the Seminole War had made their reports. And he will talk in 29 lines, 377 words, all about this issue. And the only thing he says about Missouri, nothing. But keep this in mind, this is February 15th. This is two days after the introduction of the famous Talmadge Amendment. It's the same exact day that the House of Representatives votes to tack on the Talmadge Amendment to the Missouri Bill. And he says nothing, nada. Um, another letter, February 15th, all they say about Missouri, uh, I've witnessed the reception of the union of three Western states and bills are now in progress, authorizing the people of the Alabama and part of the people of Missouri territories to form for themselves constitutions and state governments these sections of the union will probably send forward the representatives of the next Congress. No hints of the explosive slavery issue that's going to come out of it, none whatsoever. Um, another letter, uh, all they mention, uh, this is February 20th. This is five days after the Talmadge Amendment voted. Bills, which doubtless are to become laws, doubtless will become laws for admitting the territories of Missouri and Alabama to the union and the footing of the original states. We now have 21 states. When Missouri and Alabama are added, the Confederacy will consist of 23 independent sovereignties. And then he'll go on with 63 lines and over 800 words about the Florida and Spain. The rest of these letters, nothing on Missouri, nothing. And over uh, 1,300 words, 1,800 words, 560 words, 800 words, 2,000, over 2,000 words, another one, over 2,200 words, all about Florida, the Treaty of Spain, and all of that. Wow. It's like the only one to talk about it, actually, John Scott, because he's our delegate, he's one of the extant letters. When you get to 1820 to 1821, they're equal. Florida and Missouri, uh, they tend to go in tandem. So we have to take a perspective. These are congressmen writing north and south to their delegates or their, their, their constituents, very powerful statements and nothing really in the early period. They don't want to really, I don't know if they understand that this is gonna be that explosive of an issue, um, but we got to put it in perspective, I think. So um, just a little thing I always found interesting. Yeah. So clearly Missouri had many hurdles to overcome with our journey to statehood. Uh, what do you think was perhaps the most difficult for Missourians? <laughs> um, I'm going to have to go with, I'm trying to think outside the box with what was going on in Congress. Um, something different. I, I would have to say, really, it was that debate over the Talmadge Amendment and splitting between the Senate and the House rejecting it. 
Um, another little issue that's kind of interesting about the Thomas Amendment, which we'll eventually adopt, the 3630 line, slavery above, which is all of Missouri, uh, you know, above that line free, uh, was introduced very early on. And a number of similar uh, compromises like that. And the House is not buying them, uh, the majority of that. And I would have to say um, uh, an, an issue of Missouri troubling this whole nation was this idea of the Republican Party, which was supreme. There really were no Federalists. Um, the Jeffersonian Republican Party kind of maybe coming apart, dividing into, you know, um, you know Mid-Atlantic and Northeast and, and versus, um, you know, the South, if you will, the Southeast. So that was definitely one of, uh, that was a struggle to overcome, um, to get in the Union. Um, uh, Missouri didn't really help itself with this slavery issue. Um, they were adamant that we would come in uh, slavery, although the vast majority of Missouri did not own slaves um, whatsoever. Um, but, uh, you know, another issue I think that is important is when we, uh, you know, drafted our constitution and sent it off to Congress. Um, with that I don't know, most people know there's, there's a repugnant part of our constitution and the quote is to prevent free Negroes and mulattoes from coming in and settling this state on any pretext whatsoever. Open up a whole other can of worms, a whole other debate in Congress. So that leads to the second compromise. So really Missouri picked a fight. They're angry, they're ticked off. So really maybe one of the biggest obstacles we had to do is because we started it. <laughs> you know, so, just get it into the union, get it out of the constitution. Now other states had similar clauses in their constitutions, including free state, or free states had that, the rest would have been slave. But um, so maybe I think um, the typical uh, concept of a Missouri, I guess, a stereotype, we asked for it, uh, round two, we did. So we've mentioned a couple of these different amendments that were tacked onto uh, our bills for statehood, the Talmadge Amendment. Um, would you mind explaining that a little bit more? Yeah, basically the Talmadge Amendment is, is to prevent uh, spread of slavery west of the Mississippi River. And it does that by gradual emancipation. Uh, so basically what would happen is that there would be no further introduction of involuntary servitude in Missouri. And those born after the admission of the state would become free on the age, at the age of 25. So it's a gradual elimination of slavery, which already existed in the territory of Missouri. And this is an important issue because it didn't have to do with the abolition of slavery whatsoever. And I have all of the debates in Congress, read them through and through, and constantly Northerners, are, especially Northeasters, are trying, even though they, I mean, they hate slavery and they go after it, it is, is an, you know, it's immoral, things of that nature, a scar in American history, if you will. But they will say that we have no, no you know, concept, no desire to terminate it where it exists, east of the Mississippi River and territory that was acquired uh, in, uh, from England as a result of the American Revolution War. This is new territory. This is purchased later. And so they don't want that spreading of slavery beyond there. And so it only affects Missouri. Uh, another good example, this is uh, Alabama came in uh, in 1819 uh, and there was absolutely a nil really. Everybody expected them coming to slavery. So why weren't they debating that? Well, that was an original state. That was part of the original territory um, acquired in the, in the Treaty of Paris, 1783. So uh, that's a major issue. Um, no more slavery uh, west of the Mississippi River. And that was the Talmadge Amendment to try to halt that. So as we look back over these 200 years, and this is going to be a more broad question, um, of 200 plus years of history of this area, what aspects do you think uh, historians should focus on more uh, to expand scholarship on Missouri, and similarly, which areas of that are already well researched, well published on, should we as consumers of history read more about? So it's a two part uh, question. What should we uh, read more about, and what should be more well researched? There are there is something else, and uh, there is a little bit on this. And uh, while I was a professor, I don't think I have time to do this, even though I got the, the background information for it. So I can give it to anybody if they want to go with it. Uh, many of my publications do with political economy, free trade, uh, anti-tariff, especially by the Jefferson Republicans and Jacksonian Democrats. Uh, and the tariff issue, an economic issue, uh, is tied directly to the Missouri Compromise, uh, to the votes. Uh, we know the uh, Doe Faces, which is a derogatory term of the Northerners who voted uh, for Missouri's admission without the Talmadge Amendment. 
in the end. Uh, why did they do that? Well, a number of them had to do with the tariff issue. Uh, Baldwin uh, of uh, Pennsylvania is another example. And so it's funny to watch, and we've got the breakdown of these votes, who voted against the protective tariff and then broke ranks and voted for Missouri without restriction. That means no Talmadge amendment. And there were a handful, and some of them will lose their jobs over this, there's no doubt. Um, but their number one had nothing to do with slavery. It had to do with the tariff issue and how it fit national politics at that time. Uh, so there's an economic uh, component to this uh, as well. Um, and another economic component that needs to really be studied. And uh, I know some people out there who are doing this for the larger issues of commerce, especially in the Atlantic world. Uh, keep in mind, Missouri will command the Mississippi River and help flow goods out into the Gulf of Mexico and across the world. Um, that's the only, I mean, that's our outlet to the West. And that's just one more, um, not only receiver of goods, but to send hemp and, and other uh, grains and cattle and you name it, leather and everything we can produce down the Mississippi River and out you know, into the world of commerce. So there are economic issues you get in Missouri's butt in the union. Um, you know, another issue just quickly, um, the whole Jacksonian uh, rhetoric of, you know, the common man versus this moneyed aristocracy, uh, which Jackson laid against the National Bank and, and his followers went after Clay and the Whigs. There was an element of that. Um, so a lot of Missourians really didn't care about slavery as a, a moral issue. A lot of them said we wanted no restriction. Slavery can come in because it was another economic feature. We want to develop the state. We want to develop this to the, I mean, completely develop. Well, slavery is a form of development. Uh, why keep it out? But at the same time, there were those who were uh, pro-restrictionists in Missouri for economic reasons to say, well, we don't want slave owners to come in here because they tend to be aristocratic, um, moneyed aristocracy. They're thinking of these massive plantation owners that come in and destroy the land and move on. And we don't want that type of economic uh, you know, feature here because of this moneyed aristocracy. So there is this Jacksonian rhetoric that really explodes late 1820s and throughout the 1830s, starting with the issue of Missouri. So there are other, yeah, that's um, some issues to deal with. Over the years, Missouri has been associated with many different sayings, the show me state, the gateway to the West, even the buck stops here. Which one do you feel is the most fitting for our state? And why? Uh, it, it's got to be the gateway to the West. And I'm using that as a, a negative term. Uh, I have so many friends. We have a strong Native American heritage program. Uh, I've worked with uh, numerous tribes. We still are, as, we, as Missouri Manatees oversees the implementation and interpretation of the Trail of Tears for Missouri. And a lot of my friends who are Cherokee and others call it the tombstone to the West. And when you really think of that, you're looking at it from, you know, westward looking east at that thing. That thing is supposed to be there, that arch, to look westward. Um, and there's that painting that was in the, the famous painting of Manifest Destiny that was in this video that we used. You see the, you know, this almost angelic push. Here comes, you know, the train and the, the telegraph and the white folks. Here we come. And you see the Indian literally turning and running out of fear uh, towards the Pacific. And we really need to tell that story. Uh, which Missouri Manny's is doing with um, the idea of a national museum on Indian removal, which we are now planning in uh, St. James off I-44, a massive uh, project, but it will face the arch, um, not as a middle finger, uh, but maybe in defiance to say there's another story of the gateway to the West, a negative story, if you will. Um, so I, I think um, the gateway to the West is true, um, but we have to think of it in both ways. Uh, and as I had mentioned, too, don't forget, Kansas City really is possibly the true gateway to the West. Because once they cross, I mean, that's the home of the three trails, really, uh, breaking westward, uh, Santa Fe to the south, uh, Oregon and California trails out west. So, um, so much other stories to that. But Missouri becomes the conduit westward. And that's another tragic story of not just manifest destiny in the 40s and 50s, and, you know, the 1900s, but eventually... Um, the great Indian wars of, of the later 19th century, Plains Wars. So you are a, a well-versed in history, clearly a, a scholar of early American history, and you mentioned economic history, but what other aspect of Missouri specifically has captured your fascination the most and encouraged you to dive a little bit deeper into Missouri's past? <laughs> 
Oh, that's a good question. I, I would say uh, definitely the Native American aspect. Um, it's fascinating, and I, I hate to use that term. Fascinating always sounds like it's a positive word. But so, and my area is in, you know, Native American, Southeastern borderlands into this. And I still learn more and more about uh, that, that heritage in Missouri and how powerful it, it is, even more powerful than lots of, uh, you know, occurrences in, in the north and south, you know, east of the river. And I'll just give you an example. I don't know if most people know this, but, um, you know, Missouri has no real Native American presence. Yes, we have the Catherine and Booter Center, American Indian Studies uh, at Wash U. Um, in the Kansas City Indian Center, but so few, you know, representation. There's a reason for it. In 1838, it's the Trail of Tears, as the Cherokee are being pushed through Missouri, eventually in Arkansas and Oklahoma. The following year, 1839, our General Assembly enacted a law making it illegal to be American Indian in Missouri. Illegal for them essentially to be on our soil. And for those of you who may not know that, that was reinforced in fact, its greatest enforcement was in an 1899 passage of an act, General Assembly, making it illegal to be Native American. It was repealed in one sentence in 1909. 1909. Um, that's a powerful statement of eradicating anything of Native American. Yeah. And so, um, yeah, I, I think it's, um, and, and the other story of those who were pushed westward into the Louisiana territory when it was under French and Spanish rule who were fleeing wars in the Ohio Valley, Shawnee and Delaware. And they seek shelter across the Mississippi River in places that are like Perry County, for example. And then as soon as 1803 and we buy it, here comes the Americans. And I've got the letter sitting in front of me of where John Scott says they have the best land possible. I know I live 40 miles from here. Let's extinguish their title, push them out. So this is really the origins of Indian removal. Um, the early Monroe administration, Missouri is one of them. So another reason for why we want to be in the union, push out the Indians, extinguish their title. Um, and there's many letters from both Benton and Barton, our first two senators to the administration, get rid of the Indians, get them, don't even push them in here, push them on the way out. So that is, a, to me, a very powerful. And then, of course, I always like the tariff issue, but I'm not going to talk political economy because it puts students to sleep. <laughs> So we probably have a question time for maybe one, maybe two more questions. But this next one is, if someone wanted to learn more about this, what book uh, or a couple of books would you recommend uh, for them to, to dive in a little bit deeper? Oh, th this is what I would recommend. Um, or is it the Missouri crisis or just early Missouri history? Is that the uh, let's do both. Let's do both. Okay. Uh, you know, there's a, there's a great uh, four, four volume set on early Missouri history. Uh, Foley, Parrish was on my dissertation Mary, uh, committee, uh, William Parrish at Mississippi State University. And I should have it right here, but the volume that covers um, the early years, I think it really goes up to 1821 and the next one begins in 1821. So they split that. Very good reading of, about all the economic, social aspects. It's very, uh, it really synthesizes all the previous work, fabulously written for a general audience as well as the scholarly. That's fabulous. Um, as for uh, the Missouri crisis, John Van Atta, who's a very close friend of mine, Wolf by the Ears, is a fantastic one. There's a book out there on um, a Thomas, um, Jesse Thomas, who's one of the Thomas Amendment, covers a lot of that. Uh, so those are there's there's several uh, compilations of essays uh, for those. And this is I hate to do this. I just published a book on the. It's called Contesting the Constitution: Congress Debates the Missouri Crisis, 1818, 1821. It's available at the University of Missouri Press, or you can become a member of Missouri Humanities and we'll give you one for free. Uh, but it looks at the constitutional crisis. Um, that's the overriding debate. It goes beyond slavery, slavery in a constitutional sense, but uh, the debate over Missouri entering as a constitutional versus unconstitutional. They comb through, not since the ratification debates of 1787, 1780 at Congress, and Americans so dissected our constitution and pitted various sections. It was the federal and anti federalists all over again. And that's what this book is about. Um, so it's a powerful constitutional crisis because at its heart, that's what it is about. Uh, does Congress have the authority to place restrictions on states coming to the union? And they hit every section pretty much of the constitution. A book that I read uh, recently, I'm, I'm about to finish up, uh, came out in 2019, How to Hide an Empire, the United States, the history of the greater United States. Are you familiar with this work? 
I've heard of it. Yes. It's, it's exceptionally fascinating. Um, and it explores, uh, the territorial conquest of, of the United States and the unwritten histories of, of the very ter- various territories, all the way from uh, Indian territories and lands to Guam, to Hawaii, to Alaska, to the Pacific Islands, to the Philippines, um, anything and everything from uninhabited uh, Guano Islands um, and the use that the United States saw for these territories and how they how we acquired them. Um, very approachable, very interesting. It's fantastic how the author interweaves uh, various cultural histories into, into this uh, topic. Anything from the history of the Beatles to, uh, to standardization of screw depths and, and lengths. It's, it's, it's fascinating. I highly recommend it. Oh, I'll take a look at that. When I have time. That's, yes, uh, right. One thing I miss about being an academia. <laughs> they paid me to do that. So <laughs> now it's just leisurely. Well, Dr. Belko, thank you so much for your time, for your presentation this evening. Uh, thank you for joining us tonight for this program. Uh, if you'd uh, like to learn more, please feel free to reach out to Dr. Belko or myself. Please, please do. join us for the other uh, events in this series. Check out the Struggle for Statehood Traveling Exhibit now here in Springfield. And we look forward to having you at a future event. Thank you so much and good Appreciate night. It. Thank you all for listening. <laughs>